Google Hangout, the science of monsters. My name is Carly and I manage the social media community for this USA Science and Engineering Festival. First of all, I wanted to take this time to thank our participants, Sebastian Alvarado, Daniel Luxman, Stephen Schalzman, and our host, Joanne Manister. These zombie and monster experts have graciously donated their time to join us today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. This hangout is to kick off the Cobbly Science and Fiction Contest, which launches on November 1st. The contest is sponsored by the Cobbly Foundation and the USA Science and Engineering Festival, and it's open to students in grades 6 through 12. You can visit our website at www.usasciencefestival.org for more information on the contest, including entry forms. So we will address any festival-related questions at another time, or you could send them directly to our Twitter or our Facebook page. But just as a reminder, the festival is returning to the Washington, D.C. Convention Center next April. It kicks off with our first ever Extreme STEM Symposium, which is on April 24th. That's a Thursday. Our Sneak Peek Friday is back on April 25th. And then the Free and Open to the Public Expo is April 26th and April 27th. We also are going to host the U.S. News STEM Solutions National Conference, and that's the 23rd to the 25th in conjunction with the festival. So it's a full week dedicated to STEM celebration. Again, you can visit our website at www.usasciencefestival.org for more details. Now, on to the fun stuff. I am going to turn this um, Google Hangout over to our host, Joanne Manister. Joanne is a faculty lecturer for the School of Integrative Biology at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. She is a blogger for Scientific American and is very active on social media. Mashable has named her Twitter feed as one of the 25 Twitter accounts that will make you smarter, so be sure to follow that. She enjoys hosting Google Hangouts like these, including those with Scientific American and her own venture, Read Science. So thank you, Joanne. Thank you to our participants, and have a great time. Great. Thank you, Carly. And uh, welcome to all of you out there who are watching us now. Today, we are going to talk about the science of monsters and why they fascinate us. So uh, let's meet our panel of experts. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Sebastian Alvarado. He is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Biology at Stanford with a research focus on epigenetics, as well as being the co-founder of the video game science consultancy group, THWAC Consulting. THWAC has consulted on video games, including Wasteland and Outlast. Uh, Sebastian, why don't you say hi so we all see who you are. Oh, yeah. is he muted? He's muted. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Great. I'm glad to hear you and, and your little one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, next, uh, I'd like to introduce Dan Loxton. He's a Canadian writer, illustrator, and skeptic. He has written children's books about evolution and dinosaurs, and I have every single one of them. Um, today, Dan will be discussing his book, Abominable Science, which deals with cryptids such as Bigfoot. So welcome, Dan. Why don't you say hi to all of us? Hi. Thanks for having me on. Hey, welcome. Uh, Stephen Schlossman, MD, is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a staff child and adult psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He is also the co-director of medical student education in psychiatry for Harvard Medical School. Dr. Schlossman has written a book the Zombie Autopsies, which has been film optioned by George Romero. Ooh, he wrote uh, Night of the Living Dead, didn't he? Okay. <laughs> so his zombie curriculum has been adapted by Texas Instruments as part of an innovative STEM education program, the STEM Behind Hollywood. Welcome, Dr. Schlossman. Thanks very much for having me. It's fun to be here. <laughs> That's great. Um, so let's start the conversation. Um, where I would like all of you to weigh in as, uh, as you can. Um, the first question is, why do so many people like spooky movies or playing scary video games? Um, why don't we start with uh, Daniel? <laughs> I, I was kind of hoping that one would go around me. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, monsters are awesome, you know. Uh, monsters... Story, storytelling is really about conflict. Uh, you know, that's what gives storytelling its energy. And monsters are a way to embody conflict. They're, you know, they're, they're conflict that lives and attacks and comes at you. Uh, it may tell you, depending on the monster, it may tell you something about the nature of, of our anxieties about external threats, things that invade or attack, or internal threats, things that, that uh, un unravel the, the civilization we've built or which transform us individually from within. You know, this is actually good advice for any of those young people out there who are watching and are wanting to make uh, a video. Uh, in the future, right? You've just given us some good uh, fiction writing advice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sebastian, would you like to weigh in on that question? Why do so many people like spooky movies or playing scary video games? Um, I don't know. I guess for the whole movies, I, I just seem to enjoy them. Uh, I always like my creature features. I like the way these monsters looked. Um, for video games, it's something a bit different because unlike a movie that's about two hours long, you know, you're in and out, um, I guess monsters are, are kind of a part of a really interactive experience. So I guess with these horror video games, a lot of what they try and do is put you in a situation where you really have to uh, run, hide. Um, they've changed quite a bit in the last few years. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's just a way of kind of creating that type of fear and creating that type of experience. Uh, people enjoy it. I don't know, actually. I mean, I enjoy it because it's fun. Um, I guess there's that sense of threat, which is immediately reassured by the fact that you're not a real threat. So it's a safe place to explore these types of feelings. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that's an actually quite an interesting thought. Like it's scary, but you know, in reality, you're just sitting in your safe living room. So uh, let's see what Dr. Schlossman has to say about uh, yeah, well, this. I'll, I'll only answer if you call me Steve. Only my mom. Okay, I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, actually, there's some really cool research on this. So, so first of all, I, I love the creature features, too. I mean, when I was a kid, that's what they were called, and they were on from 10 a.m. Till, till noon on Saturday morning because that was when you could stomach them. You weren't so frightened. And it turns out that there's some recent research on this. So the average age that kids get interested in is around age 11, which is when I actually snuck into Dawn of the Dead, which is sort of funny. I, I told my folks I was going to see The Jerk and snuck into Dawn of the Dead where I grew up in Kansas and then had to call them for a ride home because I'd lied to them and felt doubly sort of guilty and scared. It also turns out that in, if you like scary movies and scary video games, for that matter, scary rides like roller coasters, you actually like being scared. There's a, there's a lot of data to support that. So uh, folks who go into scary movies and have kind of signs of adrenergic and arousal, like they're going to fight, they actually have a better time than the people who go in there and say, yeah, it didn't bug me. And so they you end up talking about this thing called a meta-emotion or metacognition. It sounds very shrinky, but it's how do I feel about what I feel. So if you just walk in and say, I'm not scared, you tend not to like it. If you walk in and say, I'm really scared, but I wonder why I'm so scared, those people tend to enjoy themselves more. And they're a fairly easily identified group. It, the media folks are really interested in this because it helps them to make the movies that, that sell. So, so in a way, uh, probably at the age these kids are watching these movies and, and even sort of analyzing their emotions as they watch this, this is helping with their development, helping them to become maybe more emotionally mature and sensitive people. Well, yeah, there's, there's data to show that, and, and even there's, you, you want to sort of stretch it a little bit, um, there's data to show that uh, a lot of kids who around age 11, 12, 13 start to really love the scary stuff, both boys and girls, were really anxious as littler kids. Not like so anxious that they couldn't go out, but found themselves frightened in those haunted houses that their maybe older siblings dragged them into, and then sort of learned to love it. So the way Sebastian and Daniel were saying that you know that it's not real, but you learn to sort of be able to take it and enjoy that kind of rush, um, that, that helps with growing up too. I've, I've noticed over the course of my life that my ability to take that kind of rush is, is decreasing over time. Right. My, uh, my taste in horror movies has, uh, has kind of receded and at this point in my life I really like stories about uh, dangerous creatures that can be subdued by brave heroes. I, you know, the, the kind of uh, sort of transcendent supernatural horror of something like The Ring. Uh, yeah. It's just too much for me, you know, there's no, the, the characters have no chance and, and uh, it's an unpleasant ride. Yeah, so there's got to be something redemptive for me to have a good time um, with a yeah. horror movie. The, the Saw movies are actually hard for me to watch. And I have kids, so any movie where kids get like kidnapped and taken away is hard for me. Yeah, yeah, I don't think the, kids in jeopardy. But I love zombies. I mean, they, they, they don't <laughs> discriminate. They don't care. So. My, my kids uh, give me a hard time. They're all older. They give me a hard time for uh, 
I, I stopped watching psychological thrillers after um, I watched The Silence of the Lambs. That was it. Yeah. And I was an adult. I went, that's it. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> oh, it's such a great movie. Uh, <laughs> it is a fantastic oh, movie. I just oh, can't. <laughs> <laughs> that one, forget it. Okay. I was, so, was going to mention, oh, sorry. sorry about that, no, please go no, I just wanted to jump in. It's funny you guys all mention, you know, you know, the fear of having a child and then, you know, going through, I guess, you know, losing them or something like that. Uh, it's, it's funny because the generation, I guess, of game developers and designers that are kind of out there now, you can kind of tell how the games are changing based off of how people are growing up. Because that's become like a reoccurring theme, basically, where you have to take care of someone like a child or a, you know a minor or something like that, and you basically have to handle you know losing a mission if this person who's very important to you. I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with The Walking Dead. Uh, that was a huge theme that they played on the video game uh, that they came out with last year. Basically, a lot of the story revolves around taking care of a little girl who you know. It takes on that type of position, but I just wanted to throw in that one thought. Well, there's that, that new game with um with Ellen Page and Willem Dafoe, where where he they have to sort of take care of each other, right? Even not husband or you know or daughter and, and um father. It's it's a pretty recurrent theme. It's a powerful one. Yeah. That thing so, you know, with that. these some some kind of monsters like you know the zombie apocalypse genre, the 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 monster that takes over everything. Um, the the apocalypse genre kind of requires a world with no kids uh, most of the time. Uh, these these uh, this new trend, uh, things like The Last of Us, uh, that that is finding ways through that. But but generally, those kind of stories, it's all adult zombies with uh, with just a few exceptions. Right, right. It's hard to see a kid zombie. So since we've sort of segued into zombies, let's ask some uh, Steve-specific questions. And of course, the, Sebastian and Daniel, you can jump in as well if you have some insights. But why are zombies so fascinating? Uh, good question. So let me just uh, clarify, and this is a requirement that I clarify by the dean of the med school where I work. They're, they're not real. I need to be yes. very clear about that. They're, <laughs> Thank they're, you. No such thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, but but they're fascinating. I mean, who knows why they're fascinating? There's all sorts of different theories out there. I think as far as movie monsters go, they um, map pretty well onto neurobiologic um, or, or just onto biology itself more easily than say vampires or werewolves or something like that. Um, you know, we'll hear about cryptids in, in a bit and that, that we can, that's a different kind of discussion. But then I also think they're pretty potent social comments. Uh, you know, zombies don't care about you. Um, so if you're feeling like the world doesn't care about you, which is not an atypical way to feel if you're stuck in traffic because everybody else is stuck in traffic too, if a zombie is going to eat my guts and I step to the right, it'll eat Sebastian's guts. <laughs> and it doesn't care about my guts or Sebastian's guts. And if something's going to eviscerate me, I'd like it to be about me. But it's not about <laughs> me. It's, just, it's not like a vampire. So I think that impersonal nature that's characteristic of the way we live our lives right now has made zombies, that's at least one of my pet theories, made zombies become more popular. There's also an element of comedy to zombies, which makes them sort of fun, too. Um, so, and they fit into that apocalyptic storyline that we were talking about. I love uh, one of my favorite movies is Shaun of the Dead. So speaking awesome. of comics, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. It is brilliant. So um, uh, what? So let, let's sort of speculate, because that's all we can do here. But what makes zombies hungry all the time? Well, um, let's think. Well, so well, let's first acknowledge that it's a good storyline, as Daniel said. So they, they, it makes for a compelling story. But if we were going to do the biology piece, um, you go from the neck up. There's a region of the brain uh, in the hypothalamus, the ventral medial hypothalamus, which basically means the bottom middle part of the hypothalamus. That tells you when you've eaten too much. That's the satiety region. We ignore it all the time. We'll ignore it on Thanksgiving. But um, there are infections as well as lesions that can interfere with that region of the brain, and you won't stop eating. You won't ever know that you're full, and you'll eat yourself to death. Um, you, you can move south. We could say there's a tapeworm or something that makes you hungry all the time. I'm not sure zombies have tapeworms. They probably have tapeworms because they're immunocompromised if they existed. But the <laughs> hunger itself, I think, in order to make something pathologically hungry, that's a kind of fascinating question in the zombie world because zombies are usually portrayed as ill. And the last time you were ill, I doubt you were hungry. Usually when you have a fever, you feel like not, you feel like barfing. And zombies don't feel that way. So you can do it, but you got to sort of engineer it with um, viruses that really exist out there, but you'd have to get them into the brain um, in very specific ways. So the, the, how about this, that psychological, you know, from people who are uh, cannibals, you know, where they, they sort of, there's that desire to consume that person, so they take on traits. Maybe zombies have some 
self-awareness in there that they are missing some vital essence that maybe they think by attacking that, you know, we're getting into a little more esoteric. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if this is not part of the motivation. Yeah, so so technically speaking, at least the zombies I like to think about, they lack motivation. They're um, they're like drunk crocodiles, basically. They they can't walk well. They, all they have is the most primitive of brains. Um, but if you look at some of the more um, recent storylines, um, breathers, for example, or um, or warm bodies, um, there there was a sort of desire to incorporate something alive to kind of remember what it was like to be alive. I don't think that was the intention, and at least I know Romero pretty well, I don't think that was the intention in his kind of version of what he called ghouls, not even zombies. I think it was just to create something that um, was the most primitive you could possibly think of, which was to, to you know, attack you and eat you. Um, and yet we would turn and shoot it, even though all we really have to do is walk slightly faster than it to get away. So the question was, why do humans turn and shoot these things when you could just walk slightly faster to get away? So really, humans are the enemy, not the, not the zombies. <laughs> <laughs> We're our own worst enemies. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, let me see. Um, so, are there any contagions that currently exist that can cause this zombie-like behavior? You know, do do we have any real fears of uh, an apocalypse coming sometime well, soon? You know, it's. I, I hope not. I hope we don't have these fears. Um, I go to Comic Con. They've been the last three. They always say, "When will the zombie apocalypse happen?" We always say, "It's not going to happen." They always boo us, and we always say, "Look, have you not <laughs> seen these movies? This is not something you want. This is bad. This would be a bad thing." Uh, so, so the bugs that are out there that would sort of mimic a zombie. Um, like behavior, rabies comes to mind. Uh, remember, remember though that uh, the rabies virus—it's a megalovirus. It doesn't um, make you want to eat people; it makes you want to bite them. But actually, they're terrified of swallowing anything. They—they mm -hmm. they have hydrophobia because they're, you know, the um, area around the esophagus gets swollen. Um, there are bugs like Toxoplasmosis, a multicellular organism that will infect rats and make them run instead of away from cats towards cats because the Toxoplasmosis needs to get into the cat's gut in order to reproduce in its poop. Um, there are certain fungi that invade ants. So there's, there's all sorts of examples of organisms that affect the behavior of the host just through pure luck as a means of spreading the bug. But there's nothing out there currently that could get us to the kind of level of zombie apocalyptic scenario that we see in shows like The Walking Dead. And I don't think there ever will be. And that's the skeptic in me. And my the hope, too. <laughs> that's the thing I want. We're humans. We have a lot of ways to do ourselves in besides zombies, basically. <laughs> uh, let's, wait, wait, um, what about, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, what about like your, uh, your rage virus uh, fast zombie? Yeah, you know. That scenario. I, so it's so interesting. I um I was in a an Oxford style debate at Spooky Empire, a very academic meeting I went to, where I resolved that the slow moving zombies are scarier because I still think they're scarier. I think I having time to think is like the worst thing. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, if you want to hear people get in an argument, go to Comic Con and have the slow versus fast moving zombie argument, and people, you know, wearing tights and dressed like Darth Vader and stuff, really yell at each other a lot. Um, so the rage virus is absolutely horrifying. Twenty eight days later is a great movie, but remember. They're not dead, they're just sick, and they're not trying to eat you, they're just trying to kill you. So we can't technically call them zombies by the made-up rules that exist for this particular story. Well said. That be, that's my thesis, please. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the, that, that in, um, upsurge of uh, novels of, uh, that um, you know, sort of play on the zombies. And I, I cannot remember the, the Jane Austen books. Oh, the uh, um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? Yes, um, yeah. Sin, so. Sins and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember, zombies, they're nothing, right? They're just a blank slate. So you can, you can take the zombie and put it into any storyline. They fit neatly into Pride. That's what he did with Pride and Prejudice. It was an eminent domain story. So he just took out paragraphs and put in, you know, like, we shall retreat to higher grounds where the zombies dare not get us. I mean, those are the kinds of sentences you get. And, and it works. The story actually strangely works because if you have a blank slate, you can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> it's, it's such a fascinating, um, I don't know, but what sort of... Pop culture phenomenon. Pop culture phenomenon. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> I, maybe you you can you've eaten my brain already. <laughs> so um, so a while back, the CDC took full advantage of this zombie fear and used it to their advantage to say, if you prepare for zombies, you're prepared for all sorts of disasters. What do you think of that tactic? 
Um, I think it's a good tactic. I mean, I think as long as folks don't take it too seriously, in other words, they don't read the CDC blog and think with the authority of the CDC there must be real zombies, um, which I don't think anybody did, um, it, it turns out that preparing for any disaster scenario has an awful lot of Venn diagrams, lot, a, awful lot of overlap. So if you live in, I don't live in California, but if you do um, and there's an earthquake, you fill up your bathtub with water. That's the first thing you do. It might not be the first thing you think of doing. The first thing you might think of doing is running around with your hands screaming, but probably you should fill up the bathtub with water. And that was what the CDC was trying to get across. They actually, in that piece, they used the disease that I made up, but they misspelled my name. So if you want to make a nice Jewish mother mad, you misspell her son's name. She actually called them and fixed it, which I thought was sort of funny. <laughs> I didn't care. Oh. But, but that, that <laughs> Thank tactic you, works. Mrs. Bosman. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. But I think it works. I, you know, it, it, it takes people by surprise, and then they pay attention. Because how many times have you read CDC Bolton saying, wash your hands, you know, prepare your house, have your, have your bag of canned goods, whatever, ready? We've read it a million times. We don't quite take it seriously. But then if they're talking about zombies, you perk up, you smile a little bit, and you say, hey, actually, what they're saying makes some sense. That's great. Uh, thanks for your input on that. I, I think we're going to turn our attention to Sebastian and his expertise for video games. Um, so, in a, a video game, which I don't play a lot, but my kids certainly do, um, does it matter to have a logical premise for a monster in a video game? Um, yeah, I guess so. It, it, it does, depends on the video game, right? Um, some developers already have a vision of the kind of thing, the kind of experience they want a player to go through, in which case, you know, whenever we come in, we always try and help with what we know. Um, and, and we always bring some sort of science. So. The logical premise is a great um, start for source material for their development process. Because even if they have a vision for a game, they don't necessarily know how each level will break down, how each challenge in each level will break down, and how the players expect to overcome it. So the more source material they have, the, the easier it is to work with. So something like a, a zombie, let's say, that, that has a cure or something like that, um, if there's a handful of things that seem to make sense in the real world, about how you would treat, let's say, necrosis or some sort of disease, um, and we can bring something special to that. Uh, we will, and that becomes a quest mission. So basically, players are sent out to fetch actual items that make some sort of sense. And, and what this does is it kind of increases the plausibility of the story they're playing. And one of the most important things to achieve when you're making a video game is actually creating a good immersion. Uh, and, and plausibility, bringing some plausibility to that actually does quite a bit for the players. Um, kind of like uh, Steve was saying, I've, I've seen my share of arguments where people are, you know, complaining over one sci-fi monster being real against. If you were to, let's say, do you know, uh, zombies versus so and so, or you know, this video game character versus that video game character, somebody will always bring the science card and start talking about the plausibility of these characters um, as a way of, you know, legitimizing them and you know, increasing their play experience and things like that. Um, I, I always say the zombies would win, but they wouldn't care. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's no like there's no competitive spirit, and maybe you want a little of that in your 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 game. Like yeah. Challenge the challenge. I, I was actually going to say one thing about the zombies. Um, what is it? They're they're excellent game design choices because they always spawn. Right? There's always a never-ending amount of zombies. Uh, one of the reasons zombie video games become so popular is because nobody ever really had a good reason for justifying, you know, the population of a hundred thousand people that you let's say kill in a video game, in a small island that exists, right? You know, it, just, it doesn't make any sense. But the zombies, it always just happens to make sense. <laughs> like Dead Island, that was that was. Uh. Fun. <laughs> Uh, but, um, I'll tell you, when my son started playing Resident Evil, I was like, I was shocked. What is this? What are you playing? But anyway, that's for another discussion. So, um, how can a scientist help develop a better video game? Um, so we do lots with of things. With monsters, I assume. <laughs> yeah, with monsters or anything else. Um, uh, there's two ways that we help. One way is kind of giving them this type of source material that they can work with. So they'll say, we want uh, a monster that can do this, this, and this. And what we actually do is our first, you know, line of questioning always goes towards the, you know, the hardcore biologists, people who actually see interesting types of animals in the wild and uh, that have the type of behavior that they have a game design set up for. And then what they'll do is they'll borrow from those animals and develop their game that direction. Uh, another thing that we do is we actually have uh, some very talented neuroscientists on our team. And what we do is we bring them in to actually do a bit of the ethology um, and, and basically 
kind of creating a schema for the expectations a player might have in a video game. So uh, if a level needs to be scary and the monster has to scare you, uh, a lot of times what a developer will do is they'll just play test it with a group of people. They'll play it and they kind of ask them, was that scary? And then they'll say, ah, not really. Um, I, I don't care. Uh, or, or things like that. And it, sometimes there are shortcuts that you can take in these things. Uh, a lot of them, you know, we just happen to watch horror movies and we see these ideas already in practice. But a lot of things actually make sense because they're kind of wired to our own, you know, neuroscience, our own biology. Um, a lot of that fight or flight response and things like that. So we help with uh, the people that we have that are very trained and very good neuroscientists, and they kind of come in and they talk about, you know, uh, creating the right type of context, uh, creating the right type of pacing, not just having, you know, the jump scare or something like that, but uh, creating, I guess, uh, a believable situation for the, the player to actually be scared. So, so this this all goes into scripting terror to make the game scarier. Then, so, so are there can, are there any yeah extra hints uh, that you could give on you know how do how do you make a game scary? How do you script that in? Well, the thing is, usually the, the developer has a handful of things that they already have as moments planned in the game. So what they'll do is they'll basically literally script it. You'll reach a certain part at a certain level where everything bottlenecks up to this one point. And then they'll have something play out where they take control away from the player. Uh, at that point, the player has to watch, you know, a, a cutscene where something terrible happens or something scares them. Um, that's changing a bit now because we're really working on, I guess, the technologies that allow us to create games that are getting better to kind of uh, procedurally generate these types of scares. Uh, there's a handful of games in development now that are trying to do that as well. Um, how we make it scarier, usually what we do is we play through it, we'll see a few things where like, listen, if this lasted a bit longer, or if you, let's say, um, you know, you can take advantage of certain angles that, let's say, the player doesn't necessarily always see, um, things like that. I mean, usually it's a very case-by-case -case basis where we play the part of the level and we're just like, okay, this isn't scary because I already know, I have my expectations of what actually would happen. I've played games, I know that the player will play have an experience playing games, so they'll have their own expectations. So we always kind of want to cheat those expectations that they have uh, in a given level. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that reminds me is it's just that that element of surprise, like that's that's the whole premise of that thing on on um, the computer, the Slender Man game, which <laughs> is like sends kids screaming through my house, <laughs> uh, no matter what age they are. But anyway, um, so do you feel that? Um, the horror genre of video games have gotten scarier? Um, I think they've been more explored. Um, when the first few horror games kind of came out, uh, they changed the way they designed them. So if you take something like a first-person shooter, like Doom or Quake or one of these popular games out now, um, they always gave the power to the player. And uh, this meant you know, giving you a bazooka, a handgun, and a shotgun, or whatever that you can use at any given time. And what's actually changed is that as the horror genre kind of developed and evolved, what they did is they kind of increased the odds against the player, and they've taken away their ability to have power in the game, uh, creating a feeling of helplessness. And this helplessness itself is actually what's kind of driving the fear up in, in players. Another thing is that they, they did a lot of... Uh, there's, there's a game, I, I don't know, for those of you who are familiar, it's called Amnesia. Uh, it did a really good job of approaching fear in a very unique kind of way because a lot of times it was always kind of making the player feel the sense of uh, not being able to win, basically, uh, being outnumbered by monsters and things like that. But what Amnesia actually tried doing is they limited the amount of monsters in it, and they took all control away from the player together, altogether. So what they did is they basically took away any weapons, any way you can fight against a monster. So you're pretty much left in the position that you can only run. Um, another thing that they did is they also built on the fact that not necessarily having the fear get to you right away like that, you know, a flash of a monster jumping on you and you running away, but actually thinking about how um, anxiety is far more suspenseful and far better at manipulating our emotions than just the surprise fear. So the fear of seeing some sort of uh, threat it, it, and making that last as long as possible is far more terrifying than actually seeing the threat. Because when you see the threat, you know you have to run. Um, but if you can kind of prolong that moment just before the threat, uh, for players, it's it's pretty, it's pretty funny to watch. If you can YouTube player reactions to amnesia, it's definitely entertaining. 
<laughs> so maybe Steve, you want to add something to that? The psychology of uh, you know this anxiety, prolonged anxiety versus sudden uh, threat. No, I, I think it's. I mean, I think he's just absolutely right. Um, anxiety is is always more. First of all, it's more. Um, exciting to be part of. If, if you go to a good horror movie, it doesn't start right out with things jumping out at you. It, it builds over time. And and the horror movies I like actually don't show you much. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever been as frightened as I was in Blair Witch Project. And every time something happened, the camera gets dropped. So you're just looking at the woods. Um, when I was talking to George Romero about him, when we first became friends, he would send me movies and say, you got to watch these movies. So he had me watch the original The Thing from 1956, I think, with James Ernest. And he said, what do you notice? And I'd say, I don't know, I mean, it's scary, it's in the Arctic, and I'll go back, watch again. And what he was trying to get me to notice was the number of doors in the movie. Some doors were open, some doors are not open, and how many times the characters walk past these doors. And every time you walk past a door, you get anxious, because if he opens it, something might jump out, something might not. Sometimes there's, often there's nothing there, but it increases your anxiety for every subsequent move. And I think video games would be perfect venue to create that because you kind of have control. I know amnesia. Amnesia is scary as heck, um, <laughs> and, and that's what makes it fun, actually. Actually, I was going to say there's also, I mean, this has become a very popular for formula to follow, right, taking away all the power from the player. Because uh, usually the player, I mean, to play a video game, it's always to kind of give you the type of, you know, sensation of action and being able to do something, whereas horror video games kind of take it all away. Um, another, one of the groups that we worked with... Um, Red Barrels, they, they created this game recently called Outlast, um, where, like, before I kind of go any further into, you know, Outlast or anything else like that, uh, I had to kind of say that, you know, we brought in a psychiatrist to talk about mental illnesses because they want to have the game take place in an asylum. Uh, now, of course, I'm sure just like Steve can uh, say as well, there's no reason to scare people with mental illness. Um, it's not a, a sign of fear or anything like that. And... You know, this is something that the developers had to deal with as well, and the characters in Outlast actually had some very, very questionable uh, procedure done onto them that pretty much made them the way they are. So before I go any further, you know, mental health doesn't always equate a sense of fear or anything like that. But um, in the game that we created, um, we actually really, you know, pushed that forward and saying that, you know, just because they have mental health um, illnesses, doesn't necessarily mean that they will attack you. And it kind of changed the way the game was made in the sense that in most games, if there's an enemy, the enemy's going to attack you. And what it forced a lot of the developers to do, it actually made them pick a lot of characters that would be, I guess, the antagonists in the game. But in addition to that, several characters that were in the game that actually did nothing to you. And because there was a certain sense of not really knowing who would or who wouldn't um, you know, attack you or as part of the game, uh, again, that created a sense of fear um, because there was no sense of knowing exactly uh, what was going to happen next because it wouldn't always rely on the people in front of you. We do have a question from the uh, audience for Sebastian, if we could do that before uh, we sure. cover today. Um, so um, someone is asking, what is the best monster you've created and why did it work so well? Oh, uh, so we're a pretty young consultancy. Uh, we started originally in Montreal. We have several ongoing projects. Unfortunately, I can't really talk about them. <laughs> um, okay. Our clients really, they, they make us sign away our souls uh, for through non-disclosure agreements. Sure. But, you know, if we do this again in a year or so, we, maybe there's something I can share with you guys then. Um, our team, they come with all kinds of cool ideas. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry. That, oh, that's good. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Daniel, what were you going to pipe in and say? Oh, I, just uh, going back to the, the topic of anxiety and doors, it reminded me of something that Stephen King said. Uh, he, he's, he said that there, there's a kind of relief in opening the door and seeing the monster. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, the scare level goes down in some ways. If you open the door and there's a 10-foot cockroach, you, you, part of you thinks, yikes, and part of you thinks, thank God it's not 100 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And that's what the good horror uh, storytellers play with, that, that um, dialectic all the time. If you saw The Conjuring, there's that great scene where he's, the guy's a contractor. You know he owns a flashlight. He finds the sort of cliched hidden door in the closet. He opens it. There's you know, the creepy cobweb stairs going down. And instead of saying, honey, bring me the flashlight, he says, bring me some matches. So he lights a match <laughs> to go down there. But the effect is so good, you can't, you can't blame him. And it's precisely for what you're saying because that flash, that match is going to show a little bit of something, but not the whole thing. So you don't know whether it's a ten or a hundred foot cockroach that he sees. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let 
Let me ask another question, uh, and this is free for all for any of you. Godzilla the giant lizard just doesn't seem credible anymore. Does the fact nowadays we need some sophisticated biological illness that transforms people into zombies uh, represent some sort of cultural or mental or scientific progress? Can I jump in right away just to say that I have yeah. Godzilla nightmares at least once a year. Yeah, it's Godzilla <laughs> nightmares it's still scary. The, Godzilla is still scary, and they, they recently leaked a trailer for the uh, for the upcoming Godzilla remake, and it looks scary. But it does look go. scary. Yeah. yeah. I I think it's plausible. I mean, look, Cloverfield was cl plausible. Um, there's a great movie. Um, uh, horror flick indie film called Monsters set in um, Mexico where this it becomes this kind of walled off area where these aliens have crashed and there's these giant squid like creatures walking around um, I think that maybe the part that's not plausible is that the radiation would cause you know the lizard to sort of grow and become gargantuan and wreck a giant city and be a sort of a stand in for imperialist powers which is I don't think plausible yeah. but giant creatures attacking us I could I could make that work I mean, Pacific Rim I'm not sure it worked but, but it was there <laughs> I, I give that. I give Pacific Rim a, a 37 out of 10, just on the basis of robots versus monsters. But um, <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, there probably Those are size constraints. Else. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah, there, if we're looking at it from science, but it was. Still, I I still I thought it was a really lovely visual film. It's lovely is not the right word, but it was impactful. It was, it was yeah. Impactful, right? For sure. But I mean, so, there there probably are biological constraints. Uh, you know, like the big sauropod dinosaurs; those are probably as big as animals can get on Earth without either uh, some very quirky kinds of new new physics or some kind of breakthrough in in uh, you know the the evolved material science of whatever these aliens happen to be. So I mean, we they, they were manufactured aliens in in. Uh, in Pacific Rim. Spoiler so alert. We build the <laughs> oh, robot, sorry. but we can't have a monster that big. So. <laughs> well, when, or in Avatar, because the gravity was less, they were, you know, the trees are so much taller, the people are so much taller, so you could imagine creatures coming to Earth, but then, of course, they wouldn't be able to move as well because there'd be like, <laughs> gravity, and they'd just sort of be stuck there, and for a while we'd be frightened until we realized they couldn't move, and then we'd just put a fence around them and make it a zoo. So, you know, there's... Lie there's on the ground sorts. and weakly wiggle. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd, they'd have to be advanced in some way to overcome those those um, Newtonian limitations. <laughs> so uh, let, let's take a look at uh, Daniel's uh, specialty. Uh, first of all, uh, have there been any horror movies made of uh, cryptids? So first of all, define a cryptid, and then have there been horror movies made of uh, using these uh, uh, creatures? Okay. Um... So we are a species that has been preyed on throughout most of our history. Things come along and eat us. And uh, so, you know, as we've gotten to the point where we could evolve to the point where we can tell each other stories, it's not surprising that a lot of those stories involve fierce things that lurk in the shadows or live in the wilderness. Um, and uh, as we got to the point culturally where we could really start to talk about the things we were talking about, start to think about our stories, um, uh, this tradition grew up of trying to uh, uh, demythologize monster stories, and so like um, you know, you, you have uh, characters like uh, uh, the Roman uh, Roman natural historian Pliny the Elder tried to get to the bottom of uh, mermaid stories and these these travelers' tales of, of weird creatures in the wilderness and distant lands. Um, that tradition continued through the 19th century. It was called uh, fabulous zoology. And there's a real interest in uh, trying to figure out, you know, what kinds of strange things really were lurking out there, how much was just kind of folkloric gloss on top of uh, real creatures. And, and this expectation grew up in, in some quarters that there were genuine animals behind some of these uh, very, very uh, uh, fabulous sounding stories. Uh, from the 1950s on, uh, this came to be called uh, cryptozoology. Uh, cryptozoology uh, means the study of hidden animals, and a cryptid would be one of these one of these hidden animals. Um, <laughs> there have been a number of horror movies involving cryptids. Uh, they're typically not very good. <laughs> you know, they're, you're, you're Z, Z level, uh, uh, you know, uh, blurry Bigfoot ripping ripping the arms off people on on late night television kind of thing. It's uh, they're not not good stories. So I wonder why that is. Why someone hasn't said, let's take this sort of plausible thing and turn it into a really scary movie, you know, a big well, uh, abominable snowman and so on. Well, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of much better stories 
draw upon uh, these these kind of fears. Uh, um, you know, the the idea of the sea monster has been uh, used in, in fiction very effectively many times. Uh, you know, everything from Jaws to that uh, wonderful big Kraken in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Um, uh, I d I don't know why uh, straight up cryptids are are rarely told well. Um, maybe the other panelists can think of a good example. I can't off the top of my head. You know, did, do you guys remember that show In Search Of that was narrated by Leonard Nimoy? Yes. The, the a, one a about, little bit. It's often referenced in my line of work. The one about Bigfoot scared me to death. I mean, it really. I yeah. was really terrified, and I couldn't look away either. I was convinced Bigfoot was in my backyard in Shawnee Mission, Kansas. I was I was sure he was out there, even though I lived near no mountains, obviously. So maybe it doesn't make its way into movies because by itself, when presented in that kind of documentary style like In Search of was, it was already scary enough. It actually wouldn't work on the screen. Now, everybody knows vampires aren't real. Everybody knows zombies aren't real. So, you're gonna, so you, you have no problem writing them into a storyline. Bigfoot might be out there. I don't want to see him in a movie. I, I, <laughs> maybe I'm, that's you know conjecture. Who knows? It could be something to that. It could just be that they're very overexposed. Uh, we see a lot of these things on television already. Right, and, and these hoax they come back a lot too. I mean, there's just a re the recent Frozen Bigfoot or whatever in 2008. Or oh yeah, it's just a yeah. big wheel. It just keeps on rolling. The same, yeah. same stories come up over and over. Yeah. So how widespread do you believe the the um, belief in cryptids is? Uh, what are do you, the data on uh, how it, many people ha claim to believe it? It has a really kind of fringe reputation in cryptozoology. Uh, you know, uh, uh, being into Bigfoot kind of sounds like one of the these kind of tinfoil hat wearing <laughs> ideas. You know, it, it brands you a kook right away. But it, these are actually very widespread ideas. Um, uh, in most surveys, it works out to about twenty percent of the population. Uh, who will affirm that they either believe or think probable uh, the existence of, of any given cryptid, uh, at least the big ones, you know, uh, uh, Nessie and the Loch Ness Monster, I've seen data for both of those. Uh, you know, of those people, it's a pretty small percentage uh, who are really kind of hardcore uh, believers, who are certain that there's a Bigfoot. Uh, it's usually like one to three percent of the population kind of thing, but, but very many people are open to them. and. Uh, uh, that does not surprise me because I, I was a big, big cryptozoology fan. Uh, I really thought that uh, uh, that one or more of these creatures would turn out to exist during my lifetime. Uh, I recall being in the fifth grade and consulting a Ouija board to figure out which end of Loch Ness I should concentrate <laughs> my search. You should work directly to the source. I mean. <laughs> well, <laughs> weirder things have been tried, actually, in, uh, right. in cryptozoology. Um, yeah, it. Uh, you know, these, these are inherently plausible ideas, right? Um, uh, there have been animals on the Earth very much like that. There have been large reptiles that lived in the, in the ocean. There, you know, these, these are creatures which are not really that far out. Uh, for something like a vampire or a zombie, for that to be real, the world has to be very different than the world we see around us. The world that science understands, the world that makes your microwave work, and you know, the lever on your jack that lift your car, all those kinds of the constraints of the real world have to be suspended to make those monsters true. Um, for something like Bigfoot, you, know, you don't have to change the world, you just have to find Bigfoot. <laughs> so, so it, you know, it's, a, it's an inherently believable idea. And when you approach these ideas uh, for the first time, as a, especially as a young person, um, they, seem, they seem extremely compelling. You know, there's, there's a very large amount of you know, that, that kind of uh, Mountain, mountain of evidence. Let's talk about the evidence. Huge, huge accumulation of eyewitness sighting reports and the big cartoonish footprints. Hey, Daniel, I'm going to have, have you adjust your uh, earphone or something. I'm getting some strange feedback. And that made it worse. <laughs> He's being abducted by aliens. That's what I think. You need, you need, the, you need a tin hat. You need like, a Gibson where it's it would be great if he has one right next to the computer. <laughs> yeah, no. I've got, I've, okay. You don't have I have one right here. <laughs> Daniel. I wish I had mine. <laughs> now, I don't hear the feedback, but I don't know if I hear you. No, I don't hear you. Let's see. Or did he mute and then unmute? Maybe. Or maybe he switched to microphone or something. <laughs> so while he's fixing his thing, why don't we ask uh, something that was. Um, 
from the founder of the USA Science and Engineering Festival. He is asking why does it take so much to scare people today versus when he was a kid. Um, so, you know, he says Wizard of Oz versus Friday the 13th. Why, you know, why does it take so much more to scare people? I, I guess because you're older, right? I, I'm sure you could scare a lot of little kids. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, is there a cultural shift where you know kids are used am to? I, am I back? Things? Yes. You're back. You're back. Okay. Does that sound okay? <laughs> yeah. So, we we um, okay. We we asked uh, a quick question while you were fixing things as uh, to why does it take so much more uh, to scare us uh, in modern society. Are, are, are we addicted to being scared, maybe? maybe that's a question for Steve. Well, I mean, I think The Wizard of Oz and Friday the 13th have more in common than they have separate, actually. So, I mean, I know that's, that's sort of sitting on the fence. That witch is really scary. Those flying monkeys are really, really scary. Um, and there isn't a kid, at least from my generation, who watched that movie and didn't get frightened. And when I showed that movie to my, my kids, they got frightened. The cheesy special effects tend not to frighten kids. So they've gotten, like I showed poltergeist to my, my daughters. They were like, that's not real. That tree's not real. It's not bad. So that tree just yanked that kid out of his bed. And they said, doesn't matter. It doesn't look real. So I think our willingness to suspend our disbelief because the quality of special effects has gone up so much, I think that's changed. Um, but I think, um, I think scary is still scary. Um, and um, I actually might even argue that... Um, in a weird way, that The Wizard of Oz is scarier than Friday the 13th, um, mm -hmm. because you you understand the enemy better in The Wizard of Oz. I'm, I'm sorry, in Friday the 13th. In Friday the 13th. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, this one will bounce back to Daniel. So uh, how many of us, when we were fifth and sixth grade, uh, were like, oh, I had to read all about UFOs and Bigfoot and Nessie and all these things? And, and maybe Steve can uh, jump in on this too, but what is it about that age? Um, that that get, you know we start exploring that. Well, kids kids are curious, and uh, you know these are these are just inherently fascinating ideas, uh, and many of them have a, a sort of intuitive plausibility. Um, we we want to know if those things are true, and uh, you know at, at when you're 12 years old, your kind of defenses are not built up in the same way. You don't uh, you don't have the same kind of often poorly considered kind of knee-jerk skepticism about about these things. We, we have uh, uh, a kind of, we've immunized ourselves by the time we're adults against these ideas which are uh, very interesting uh, in, in many cases. So like in my line of work, you know, I, I work for Skeptic Magazine where I do the, the kids section. Uh, in, the, in that area, uh, you come across very often people who will uh, uh, kind of denigrate these these strange paranormal ideas as being very very silly, as being self-evidently silly. But I don't I don't agree. I, I, <laughs> in many cases, people have experiences which are over seem to them to be overwhelming uh, testimony from nature that these things are true. So, for example, uh, if a if a ghost attacks you in your bed, uh, you will. <laughs> in many cases, find that extremely compelling. Uh, no matter what you've, uh, uh, you know, what what uh, you've heard about why you shouldn't believe that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's very compelling what you just said. I um, so so when you get to be around 11, 12, 13, your brain's just big enough to start to know that the rules are okay to be broken, but not so big, or not so maybe acculturated to know that there's a certain threat involved in being willing to break the rules. In fact, it's all about breaking rules. I don't only, I, I'm like Mulder. I want to believe. Like, like I, I, um, I, I don't look like Mulder, unfortunately, but I, but I like Fox Mulder a lot because I like, the, I, not only do I sort of believe in aliens, I really want there to be aliens. I think it'd be incredibly cool. I will never probably get to see an alien, but if one landed, I'm pretty sure I'd try and say hi. Uh, and, and that's part of sort of the youth and all of us. It's really a golden age from like 12 to 18 or 19 where you're willing to go explore these things. We, we just watched The Blob with Steve McQueen. That movie would not work if it weren't the teenagers who went to go find it. It wouldn't work if it were the doctor. He would let it be. I love that movie. 
It's a great movie. It's a, my daughter was like, this is terrible. And I said, this is. This oh, is it's fantastic. National treasure. Yes. <laughs> it is. I'm looking here at some questions, um, and it uh, brings us back again to zombies. So zombies are the hot topic. So um, this one, this person wants to know, I never understood um, the obsession of zombies to brains. And uh, they would love to get some clarification on that matter. Uh, sure. Is there any good explanation for that? No, no, there's none. In fact, it's it's a um, it's a fluke of one movie, a Return of the Night of the Living Dead, which was a comedy, which is not a. I mean, some people love it, some people don't like it, but in it they go around going brains, brains, brains. It was that one movie that sort of changed the landscape and made it part of a lot of zombie movies. But if you look at sort of zombie purist movies. Um, Resident Evil, any of Romero's films, um, Shaun of the Dead, which is a real zombie film, they'll, they'll eat any part of you. They're not particular to brains. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, they need fiber, right? There's no fiber in brains, so they got to have something to move their cells. So that's it's funny the, because there are like um, uh, four questions in a row about the brains. And yeah. is, is, is the brain an analgesic, you know? Right. <laughs> Why <are> they looking? <laughs> it, it was one movie, and they were just trying to be funny. That, that was it. That was the whole thing. <laughs> kind of funny. Oh, well, well, that's enlightening to me, uh, and I appreciate you clarifying that, actually. So, um, uh, in zombie stories, here's another question. Is there ever a reason given for why zombies, who are supposed to be dead, don't get eaten by wild animals or decomposed by bacteria? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I asked that of George, and he said, why do you got to ask so many questions? That was his <laughs> <laughs> so, so it wouldn't work for the storyline. I mean, what, what I've said is um, that the zombies are, are sort of more reptilian, so they will avoid, as, as some reptiles will, cold-blooded things or things that seem to be rotting and, and falling apart in, in favor of live prey. Why they would not eat birds and cows and things and only eat humans, that's a harder one to explain, but you could sort of say, well, the humans are in their face more often, so they're eating them. And since they're always hungry, they're also eating the birds. They're just also eating humans as well. No, so why, it's not an so unusual why for... Was that... I'll let Daniel go ahead. I was just going to say it's not unusual for predators to have some kind of specific prey item. That, um, but why uh, why don't the animals eat the zombies? It's, yeah, it's, why why yes. don't dogs just go nuts and say I'd like that? And well, they do actually in some of the in World War Z okay. they do. That's in fact that's how Max Brooks had the um, zombies differentiated with the golden retriever sort of sensing the zombies and or not the golden, but German shepherds and then being able to attack them. And there are some zombie movies where the animals do attack the the zombies to to eat them too, especially um carrion type animals, animals that that prey on already dead things. Um, there's the scene in um, 28 Days Later when the raven pecks on the eye and the you know the tree and the blood falls in the guy's um, guy's eye. So um, it's a little bit gory. Sorry, but um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean it's all fair. None of it's real, so we could we can make it up as we're going along. All right. So as far as decomposition and bacterial and um, you know parasitic, uh, you know the the normal creatures you see on maybe rotting. Um, items, maggots, and things like that. We, we do see this sort of thing with zombies, and then limbs are falling off, and, yep. you know, there, there is a lifespan to a zombie. We, yes. see, we see a little bit, but they still seem to, to uh, shuffle along a lot longer than you would expect a carcass to do. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. And in the, in, the, um, in the book I wrote, they're not dead. They're, they're philosophically dead. They're defined as dead by the United Nations, so you can go ahead and feel okay about shooting them, which, of course, is the, the tongue-in-cheek moment, because you should never feel okay about shooting something that's live, <laughs> I, I would think. Um, but um, the, it turns out that the organism, which is engineered by nefarious hedge fund managers and, uh, to make the market fall, um, has oxygen carrying capacity. So even though they're getting sicker and sicker and sicker, the organism itself functions as hemoglobin and carries oxygen around. This is really dorking out to make this work. But, um, but that sounds otherwise, awesome. it, it was a fun story to write. But otherwise, you're right. They would all fall over eventually, and the thing would be over, and we'd go on with our lives. <laughs> Um, be a terrible stench and yeah, right, right, and we have to clean up. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've got a question here for Sebastian. Uh, in a video game, can a monster be too frightening? What is the scare line that can't be crossed? Ooh. I don't know. Uh, video games have actually been that kind of media that keeps on pushing it. I've yet to see it go too far. Um, I think they get away with a lot more in a video game than they would in a Hollywood movie, so I guess you have to keep watching. Um, basically, there are no monsters that I think are too scary, but really the way we're getting closer to the game is, is getting scarier, so the way we can immerse ourselves is getting better, and that's pretty scary. 
So, um, why don't uh, oh. you know? We'll just uh, wrap everything up here in just a few minutes. Uh, is there anything that uh, each of you would like to add to our audience about the science of monsters? Uh, it could be a profound thought or just something very simple. Uh, Daniel. Well, I uh, I am. A person who's always been interested in monsters. I'm still interested in monsters. Uh, you know, I started out as a cryptozoological believer, and now I'm I'm a kind of a specialist critic of the topic. Um, but I, I just think it's these are inherently interesting ideas, and so I, I you know the, the the grade five kid who's going to his elementary school library to look for books on monsters. Uh, you know, keep keep reading them. <laughs> Get it's, this uh, one. <laughs> yeah, ideally, that's that's a good place to start. Um, these are interesting topics. I, I, uh, I'm delighted when I get an opportunity to share my love for these topics, and I hope that other people feel the same. Okay. Well, I'm glad you joined us today. Sebastian, you, do you have any last thoughts on monsters and video games? Monsters and video games. Um, don't get too scared. Uh, they're not real. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, keep, uh, if anything, I guess... Like what we do with uh, with all the work that we've done, I mean, the best inspiration we take is necessarily uh, not from fiction, but real life. I mean, there's some pretty incredible life out there in the jungle, in the desert, and in your own backyard. Um, just really how you look at it, and really anything can be a monster from that type of angle. So, and they can already do really amazing things already. So, I mean, that's has nothing to do with real monsters, but I mean. That's where we kind of draw a lot of our inspirations from when we try and build a monster, something that already makes sense. So yeah. go look out into the world, to the zoological backgrounds of, of these monsters. Yeah. That's great. Actually, I love that. That's very inspirational, and it is a very valid point. Get back to nature, enjoy what's out there, the, the, you know, the uniqueness and, and the oddities of nature. So, uh, Steve, what would you like to say in closing? Um, well, those guys already said what I would have said. I mean, it's it's all um, it, it, monster. It's incredibly compelling storylines. Nature itself is where you get your ideas, and just just have fun. I mean, the imagination is an amazing thing, and if you can take things from nature, kind of co-op them, put them onto your own stories, tweak them just a little bit, you can tell some really really cool tales that can send chills up your spine in, in exactly the right way. Um, so anybody who wants to explore these storylines, I encourage you to just keep doing it. Don't let anybody tell you it's silly. It's, it's great fun, and you got, you got to do it. Great. You guys, this has been a fantastic hangout. I love hanging out with really smart people who know their stuff. Um, I've learned a few things myself, and uh, I appreciate you being here on behalf of the USA Science and Engineering Festival. And thank you to all of you who uh, watched the program and sent in your questions. And uh, um, be sure to visit their website uh, in order to uh, learn more about the Science and Engineering Festival. And I can't remember the dates right offhand, but if you go to the, their website, you can uh, learn more and be sure to participate. Right. And there's Carly. She can give us details, and then we can uh, say goodbye. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much. And I apologize about the abrupt ending to the first part of the Signs of Monsters. But again, the festival dates are April 26th and 27th. That's the free and open uh, event to the public. The symposium is the 24th, and Sneak Peek Friday is the 25th. Our website is www.usasciencefestival.org. Thank you all so much to our participants. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, audience. Okay, what do we do? So now we.